welcome to warm weather and with it determinants. I don't think there's any causal connection, but you never know. On the other hand, I can't quite start determinants until I finish, I suspect, the previous stuff on least squares. So my plan is, I, I maybe have 10 minutes, I kind of screwed up one example last time, and that's why I didn't quite finish what I wanted to say, sorry about that, but I'll just uh, mop it up now. If, so, I don't know, any questions that are, anything on your mind before I just sort of do a little bit of least squares and then move on to determinants? Sound okay? Okay. Right, just to remind you what we're doing. We're trying to solve AX equals B. But we decided we can't always solve it. Sometimes the equation is uh, inconsistent. There's no solution. So if no solution, then maybe one thing you can do is settle for second best, which in a least squares solution. X star, it's not quite perfect. It's not perfect because if it were perfect, then this quantity would be zero, because AX would equal B. And so its length would also be zero. Well, we may not be able to do that if there's no solution. We can't do it, but maybe we want this less than or equal to B minus AX for all X in Rm. And A, as always, is an N by M matrix. Well, not always, but that's what it is at the moment. Okay, so basically, out of all the possible Xs, this one does the best. Now, as we saw last time, there may be multiple ones, and just to review, we're able to characterize the whole thing. The solution, so what we showed last time is that we have the following equation. X star is a solution of this very important normal equation, it's called. A transpose A X equals A transpose B. And we defined transpose last time. So if you find all the solutions of that equation, any one of them is a least squares solution. Now, if we also showed, if the kernel of A happens to be just the zero vector, the M, that's an M vector, of course, if that's the case, then we showed that A transpose A, which is a square matrix, we show that this is actually invertible, because it has the same kernel. And a square matrix with zero kernel is automatically invertible m by m. So you can actually take this equation and multiply on both sides by the inverse of this matrix, A transpose A, and you get x star is A transpose A inverse times A transpose B. And this is then, in that case, the unique least squares solution. Okay, so if the kernel of A is not zero, there will be multiple solutions, and the best you can do is solve this matrix vector type of equation. But if, on the other hand, this is invertible, because the kernel of A is zero, then there's one solution. And you can find it either by solving this equation or directly by finding the inverse. Okay, so, by the way, a philosophical question. Suppose you have, I'll use different letters for it, what the hey. Suppose you have, say, CX equals R, that matrix equation, where you know C is invertible. How would you solve this? Well, one way you can do it is by doing a reduction on this. Or, you can solve it by... finding x equals c inverse r. So I'm assuming here that c is invertible. 
if you happen to know that. So which way do you prefer? Well, this is normally easier to reduce this than to find the inverse. For a two by two matrix, on the other hand, there's a, the inverse is really easy to find. The only reason that I would bother to find the inverse is if I wanted to repeat the computation with multiple R's. Then you'd have to do every one separately. You'd have to do the reduction, see what steps you needed there, and keep track of the different vectors. Whereas once you have the inverse, you kind of have the general formula. So I don't know, that's just a little bit of philosophy that has nothing to do with least squares, except that, of course, when you, if, if you're in this case, you don't have to find the inverse. You could still just solve that equation. So this is always a possible method, regardless of whether or not that's invertible. This, this equation will always work if you just solve it in the traditional way. But if it is invertible, then you can also do that if you want to, if it's easy to find the inverse. So normally with a 2 by 2, this, I particularly use this with a 2 by 2 because the inverse formula is so easy. But for larger ones, unless you happen to know the inverse or you have multiple b's that you want to resolve for, just repeat the same question with multiple b's. I, I, I can't know. Know. think this one is easier. All right, so the only other thing that we said last time was geometrically the interpretation of... So the geometric interpretation is that the image of A is a subspace of Rn. Could be all of Rn, bless you. If it is all of Rn, then you don't need to muck around with this least squares because you will be able to solve ax equals b for any b. If b is in the image, then you have an exact solution. But if b is not in the image, say b sticks out here, then what we found is that the ax that we want, or ax star, is the projection of b. So I just want to remind you, ax star is the projection of the vector b onto the image. So you drop the perpendicular, and that's the distance here from the correctness of the solution. But the projection's the best you can do. If you picked another ax for some other x, the distance to b, this is how, how we're telling when we're close to the solution. We're measuring the distance between what we hope was b and what actually is b. And we see that that distance is bigger than the perpendicular distance, no matter where you are. If you're not actually on the projection, then your distance is worse. It's bigger. So your solution is worse. It's not as good as the least squares. Okay, so that's just complete review from last time, but it summarizes everything we did. And then everything else is sort of examples. Um, I have got one, I, I did a couple of examples. I wanna, I wanna do another one that comes from a quiz you, the solutions to this are online, but you know it's sort of nice to see them solved for the first time. So what you're trying to do is fit a curve of the form y equals ax squared plus bx, as it turns out. That's a specific sort of quadratic. Try to fit this to the data. And we're given four points which we'd like to lie on a curve like this. So minus 1, 16, 0, 8, 1, 4, and 2, 6. So the question is, find A and B that fit this best. Find A and B for best fit. So if we only had, say, the last two points, then you would hope that you could actually, you have two pieces of information and there's two variables to find, so you'd hope you'd be able to solve those equations and actually find A and B. Once you have more than two though, you have to be very lucky for all three of them to be compatible and give you the same A and B. And actually this one's a disaster if you look at it. You plug in x equals zero and you find that y has to be zero no matter what A and B are. <laughs> so this one is bad. You see, no matter what you do, you're never gonna lie on it. But anyway, the philosophy is, I'm not going to plot the exact points, but you have a bunch of points. And then, you know, these different curves, they all go through 0, 0. They look like that. They look like that. What we want to do is we want to pick one that minimizes the square, the sum of the squares of the differences, effectively, vertically speaking, from the points to the curve. That's the geometry of what we're trying to do. So how are we going to set it up as a least square solution? So when I say best fit, 
I mean in the least squares sense. Again, I'm trying to minimize the sum of the squares of the distances. Squares are a little bit different from just adding up the sum of the distances. Squares are particularly harsh when you're far away. Because if you're a distance of 2 away, the square is 4. If you're a distance of 3 away, the square is 9. On the other hand, it's pretty forgiving of little distances. If you're only, say, 0.3 away, you're actually only 0.09. So it really wants, you really want to be close. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to set this up as a bunch of equations that we're trying to solve uh, by means of plugging in these values one at a time. So if I plug in x equals 1, I get a minus b equals 16. I'm going to put the y on the other side. If I plug in x equals 0, I get, so I, maybe I'll write 1a minus 1b. If I get 0a plus 0b equals 8. If I plug in the 1, 4, I get 1a plus 4b equals 4. Oops. And if I plug in 2, I get 4a plus 2b equals 6. So, uh, sorry? Uh, the third equation. Oh, yes, it should be 1b. Thank you. Okay, let's just go back to that. x equals 1, 1 squared, 1. Yes, 1a plus 1b equals 4. Thank you. All right. So now we should express 1 minus 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 4, 2. We're trying to solve this times the vector a, b equals this vector, 16, 8, 4, 6. Okay, I hereby dub the A, and I hereby dub the, damn, I'll have to make it R, because I've already used B. You've already used A. I've used little a, capital A. Okay, you might argue that little b with a vector on top is different from the scalar b, but that's just playing with fire. I think we can all tell the difference between capital A and little a, so that doesn't count. All right, so we're trying to do a least square solution. Maybe I'll dub this x. OK, so we're just trying to do a least square solution. All, the only difference between this and the other problems I looked at last week were, is that you had to do a little bit more work to get it into the least square setting. But once you have it, it's different no different from the other. So I'm going to try to solve the equation a transpose ax is equal to a transpose and I will resist the temptation to write b. I'm just going to write r instead. OK, so we're going to have to calculate a transpose a. So let's, uh, let's just do that over here. So a transpose a is equal to a transpose. I write, again, the columns of a become rows. So I get 1, 0, 1, 4. And then I have minus 1, 0, 1, 2. And then a. 0, 1, 4. And because there's only two variables, this should be a 2 by 2 matrix. And what, what am I doing? I'm putting extra minuses just out of, just for fun. Okay, 1 plus 1 plus 4 times 4 is 18. Minus 1 plus 1 is 0, 8. This has got to be symmetric, so it's 8. If you don't believe me, do it again. The last one is 1 plus 1 plus 4 is 6. So there's A transpose A. I'm also going to need A transpose R. So let's compute that. I've already got A transpose. And R is the vector 16, 8, 4, 6. So what do you get when you multiply it? You get 16 plus 4 is 20, plus 24 is 44. Whereas this is minus 16, plus 4 is minus, I think you get 44, 0. Does that agree with what I had? Yes. OK, so this equation becomes 18, 8, 8, 6, x equals 44. Zero.
and you can either solve this by means of this or you could take the inverse of this matrix quite easily. I'll just do it this way, what the hey. So what do we get? Well, first of all, I guess what I might do is just divide by 2. And then this can become 2, 1, no, 4, 3, 0. And then so I'm not, 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 not going to waste time on this. I need to move on to determinants. It turns out that the solution is 6 minus 8. Do we believe it? 6 nines are 54 minus 4 eighths 32. Yes, you get 22. Whereas 4 sixes are 24 minus 3 eighths. Zero. So I'll, I'll now leave those details to you. So basically, that was equal to A and B. So basically, the polynomial is y is 6x squared minus 8x. That's the best fit. Question? You say that it's C square. Yeah. But I don't see any squares here. As far as I'm concerned, it could be to the fourth or whatever. OK, so the question is, where are the squares? And they're very nicely hidden in the whole, in the whole thing. But what have we done? We have minimized the distance b minus a x star. In fact, we've minimized the square of that distance. OK, so let's examine what this is. OK, sorry, this is not b. This is r in this problem. OK, we have minimized that. The whole machinery was designed to minimize either the length or the length squared. Because if you minimize the length, you also minimize the length squared. You agree with that? If you, since the length is positive, if you find the smallest square of the length, you have also found the smallest length. OK, so what is this? Well, r is what I want this to be. It's the vector of y coordinates. OK, so this is the, the vector of y coordinates, 16, 8, 4, 6. Minus A, well, if I take A as this matrix, 1, minus 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 4, 2, and I multiply it by this AB that I found, which is 6 minus 8, what is this? Well, this is essentially the x coordinates that I get if I take this particular polynomial and plug in the values that we have of x's, minus 1, 0, 1, and 2. So let's just take a look at that. 16, 8, 4, 6, the y coordinates. And then, I'm sorry, these are the y coordinates you get if you plug in the x's. So if I do 6 plus 8, I should get 14. Is that the y coordinate that I get when I plug in minus 1 into this? Yes. If I plug in minus 1, which was the first x value, into this, I get 14. If I plug in 0, I get 0. If I plug in x equals 4, I will get minus 2. And if I plug in x equals 2, which is the last one, I will get 24 minus 16, which is 8. OK? So when I, when I form this vector, I've left out the square here. What am I doing? OK, well, here's the polynomial, or the quadratic. y equals 6x squared minus 8x. So where are the zeros of this? One is at 0. And the other one is at 4 thirds. Right? I cancel out a factor of x. So it looks like this. And I have my four data points, which are minus 1, 16 up here. I have 0, 8 up here. I have 1, 4, which is here. And I have 2, 6, which is here. And what this vector is, is saying, OK, that's the y-coordinate of this point. 14 is the y-coordinate of the point along the same line. I didn't draw it very well. So this is 16. 14 is the coordinate actually on the curve that I found. OK, there it is. I plugged in x equals minus 1. I wanted it to go through 16, 
but it actually goes through 14. Okay? Zero, I want it to go through eight, but it actually goes through zero. Uh, one, I want it to go through four, but it goes through minus two. And finally, two, I wanted to go through six, but it goes through eight, apparently. I didn't do this very well, but uh, yeah, four thirds is over here. <laughs> Never mind. I put one in the wrong place. One is down there, and two is all the way up here. So two goes through eight, but we thought it should go through six. So basically, this distance here, this vector, when you take the distances, is two. Well, the difference is 8, 6, minus 2. So this length is 2, the next length is 8, the next length is 6, and the other one is minus 2. It's a negative because we're below. But that's the discrepancy. So this vector is the discrepancy between the wanted y-coordinate and the actual y-coordinate. And when I, square, when I take the length squared, I'm squaring these distances. So it's least squares, because I'm looking at these four distances, and I'm saying that I'm adding up the squares. And I claim, out of all the parabolas you could draw, if you repeat this with these four points and add up the squares of the distances of the y-coordinates between the desired and the actual, then that parabola has the best fit. And it has the least quantity right here. Okay? You can't do this. Yep, this only works for squares. Only works for yep. Three yep. yep. Otherwise, you probably have to use some calculus. Okay. There's no calculus here. Another question. Um, when you take the inverse of a times of a and then multiply by a times of r. You don't take the inverse. Okay, sorry. Yeah, if you take the inverse of a transpose a, right, and then. Uh, do you not get 6 negative 8? Well, you have to because, look, I, I checked it by multiplying it. So, yeah, you should get the same answer. All right. Any other questions about this? Yes. Is this still on? Okay. Sorry, my buttons are coming undone. Because the weight of the mic. So the, the question is, is there a reason to compare the squares instead of the regular distance? Well, the regular distance is the sum of the squares, square root. Right? Pythagoras' theorem. It's all about squares. So that's how it comes up. We just took distances. Okay. All right. One other thing on this chapter before I move on to the determinants is that you can actually get an a fourth formula, yet another formula for orthogonal projection. Yet another So orthogonal projection, again, take four. Okay, here we have the following scenario. We have a subspace V and a basis of V v1 up to vm. So let's say this is a subspace of Rn, but maybe not all of Rn. It's dimension little m. So we form the matrix A, as we've done before, whose columns go up to v, or v1 through vm. Well, we've seen that AX star is the projection of B onto the image of A, which is V. So remember, the image is the span of the column. So M of A equals V. So this means if you want to find the projection orthogonal projection of any vector b, you have to just find ax star. But ax star, we already understand something about ax star, or at least we know something about x star itself. 
in particular, we know that X star is equal to A transpose A inverse A B. All right, now, how do we know this inverse exists? Well, it all depends on what the kernel of A is. We want the kernel of A to be just zero. But if these are linearly independent, then the kernel is zero. So it's supposed to be a basis. This, this will fail if you have redundant vectors in your, in your list here. If you have any redundant vectors, then you can't take this inverse. But otherwise, you can. And so AX star, which is what we want, is A, A, A transpose A inverse A, B. In other words, to project B, this is the projection of B onto V. So, in other words, to project B onto V, you multiply it by this horrendous mess here. So the projection onto V as a matrix is A, A transpose A inverse A. That's it. That is another formula for the orthogonal projection matrix. But it's kind of weird unwieldy. You have to find a product, then an inverse, and then two other products. I've left out a transpose here. There was a transpose there in the original formula, so that's got to work its way down. There, that's better. Sorry about that. OK, I want you to compare this with the formula I said last time. Here was the formula from last time. If V1 up through Vm were actually orthonormal. And last time we called them U. Then the quantity A transpose A is just the identity, M by M. And that was easy to see. We saw this last time, so I won't dwell on it. In that case, The middle term is the inverse of the identity, which is just the identity itself. And the projection is A, A transpose. Last time I did this, but I called the matrix Q instead. And I had Q, Q transpose. So this is same as we saw last week. And I was very careful to say that it's not A transpose A. It's A, A transpose. So last week we did an example of where you had a span of this subspace as a bunch of orthonormal vectors. And then you don't need this middle term. So here is a more general method. Here you do not need the columns of A to be orthonormal. Whereas if you want to use this formula, then they do have to be. So columns of A have to be linearly independent, but not necessarily orthonormal. Remember, orthonormal means that the length of, it, of any column, if you think of it as a vector, is 1, and the dot product of any two columns is 0. That's a very special and restrictive case. And you could always use Gram Schmidt to turn a non-orthonormal into an orthonormal. So there's a lot of flexibility here. So I'll just give you a quick example of that. That's not really related to least squares, except that we use the method of least squares, or at least the conclusion from it, to find the formula. So it's a sort of spin-off rather than an application per se. So uh, do I even have an example? I don't really have an example. They're too messy. In practice, this is a really nasty formula to apply. It's best done by a computer. So I'm going to just move on. I need to talk about determinants anyway. We've got a quiz coming up pretty soon. All right, so any brief questions about that? I, I still think the best way to find the projection is from, the, if, if you don't have an orthonormal basis at least, is, is to do what we did way before the midterm and just use that formula, v dot x over v dot v times v. It worked just fine before. This is sort of a... You're very good at inverting matrices, but otherwise it sucks. All right, no other questions? Okay, let me move on to determinants. This is chapter six. Dense. 
Wow. Now, this has nothing to do with mortgages or anything like that. The terms. Okay. Uh, so we saw for two by two. You get AD minus BC. And it turned out that there were two things that are useful about that. So one is that, in fact, this matrix, matrix is invertible if and only if its determinant is non-zero. So if the determinant is zero, it's not, it's not invertible. Otherwise, it is invertible. And there was something more to it that we kind of saw actually in Math 201, but we didn't really stress here, and that it turns out that if you consider the vectors like this, here's the vector AC, and here's the vector BDC. These are the columns of the matrix. And you form this parallelogram. The area is the absolute value of the determinant of the matrix's columns are those vectors. So we saw that. And actually, that tells you why the matrix is not invertible if the determinant is zero. See, if the determinant is zero, these two vectors are actually along the same line. And therefore, the, the matrix is not, uh, the, the uh, area is zero, and vice versa. So that's kind of nice. So we also saw how to deal with three by three determinants. Um, and actually, if you have the columns U, V, W, we saw in Math 201 again that the determinant of this is the triple, bro uh, triple box product. This is the triple box product. Which, again, is a volume. Well, the absolute value of it. So here's U, V, and W. These are three vectors, three-dimensional vectors. And we form this parallelopiped here. I don't have enough room for it. I'll squish it in like that. So we form this parallel of piped, and the absolute value is the volume. And there were results that said, oh, actually, it doesn't matter what order this is. You can flip the order of any of these U, V, and Ws, and it will work. If you flip V and W, you get a different sign. You get a minus. But if you take the absolute value, it goes away. So uh, that's one way of looking at a 3 by 3 determinant. But another way of looking at it is this. Well, actually, before I say this, if these vectors are not linearly independent, then all three lines in the same plane, maybe even on the same line, but they at least lie on the same plane. And therefore, that volume will be zero. And if they're not linearly independent, then that matrix is not invertible, and vice versa. If, they're not, if the matrix is not invertible, these are linearly dependent, and so this thing all collapses onto one plane, and its volume is zero. So once again, the determinant determines whether this matrix is, not, is invertible or not. If the determinant is zero, it's not invertible. Otherwise, it is. It's all very nice. Now. Uh, since you have to calculate a bunch of 3 by 3 determinants, we saw how to do this in Math 201 again, but it might be useful to learn a different formula, which is called Saris's formula, and it looks like this. So you want to take a determinant of a 3 by 3 matrix. It only works for 3 by 3 matrices. So you want to take the determinant of this. So what you do is you make a ghostly copy of the first two columns. out there. So this is the column rewritten. This is the second column rewritten. And then you put these nice lines like this. And then all you have to remember is to put minuses and you add them all up with those coefficients. So what I'm going to do is multiply those three numbers plus those three numbers plus those three numbers, minus those three, 
minus those three, minus those three. When I say those three, I mean the product of all those three. So, for example, this is called Saris's rule. That we had learnt back in. Sure. There are six signs and six products. There are three here, and then there are three there. And the left three have the minuses. So, for example, if I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, what the hey? I rewrite the 147 first column. I rewrite the 258, and we'll see how good I am at multiplying. So I got minus, 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 plus, plus, plus. So the determinant is equal to 1 times 5 times 9 is 45, plus 2 times 6 is 12, times 7 is 84. 3 times 4 times 8 is 12 times 8, which is 96. And minus 3 times 5 times 7 is 105. 1 times 6 times 8 is 48. And 2 times 4 times 9 is 72. Whatever that is. <laughs> I'm not going to add that up. You fill it in. Whatever. Okay, but that tells me the determinant of the thing. And from our point of view so far, at least until we get up to, say, section 6.3, I can tell you that all we care about is whether it's zero or not. That's all that's really relevant for the moment. Because it will tell us whether that matrix is invertible or not. And right now, I can't tell just by looking at it whether that works out to be zero or not. <laughs> I was hoping that I would have some... Oh, well, what the hell? We'll just work it out. It's not that hard. 129, 135, 225, minus 50. Yeah, looks like it's zero. Ha. Huh. Well, maybe we should have realized that anyway. I'm sure if we think about it, we can see what the linear combination is, or else I've made a mistake. But anyway. That is a simple computation of Saris's, using Saris's rule here. Oops. Saris only works for three by three. You cannot do this on higher dimensional matrices. Okay, any questions about that technique? If you prefer, you can do the old technique and I want to just review that because it's the only way to really do bigger dimensional matrices. So the old technique that we learned for finding this is you take the one and then you take this submatrix here. So this is one times the determinant of this submatrix, five, six, eight, nine. And then you move over to the two and then you take this submatrix so you look at the, not the same row or column, but everything else, but with a minus in front. So it's two, minus two times the determinant of four, six, seven, nine. And then finally, you move over to the three, which I'll put a diamond around, and then the rest of the rows and columns are this matrix. So it's plus three times the determinant of four, five, seven, eight, et cetera. And you'll get exactly the same thing as that. Saris's rule just wraps it up in a different manner. That's easier to compute. All right, so any questions about any of this 3x3 three three stuff? The reason I go back to this older definition is, as I said, that is the only way to do higher than 3x3 three three in general. And so now we've got to look at this somewhat messy business of trying to extend the determinant to higher dimensions. So the whole game here is we want to find some function of the matrix entries that tells us whether the matrix is invertible or not. And if we're lucky, it'll have something to do with volumes as well, just like the 2x2 and the 3x3 case. So 
in order to mo there's no real other motivation and this there's no motivation for how this formula comes up it, I'm just gonna pluck it out of the air but then later we'll see why it works and actually it's very well motivated it's really the only thing it could possibly be as it turns out but we're not really in a position to say that yet so I now have to go into the into the gory details of the actual construction. So for four by four and higher, although this also works for three by three and two by two, here's what we're going to do. Let's say that we pick some row. Doesn't matter which row. Pick any row. Pick a row. Any row. Okay, what we've got to do is repeat the idea of ignoring all the matrix entries that are in neither the row or the column of a particular entry. So we've picked a row. Let's consider the first element in it. Okay, if I just ignore that column and that row, I've deleted one row and one column out of an n by n matrix. But what am I left with? An n minus 1 by n minus 1 matrix. So if I take this and this, and I pack them together like this, then I get an n minus 1 by n minus 1 matrix. Sub matrix, if you like. So. For any element, i, comma, j, I want to consider the matrix A, i, j, which is a new matrix. It's n minus 1 by n minus 1, whose which is the same as A with the ith row and jth column removed or deleted. So going back over here, if I focus on the one and I cross out that row and that column, so the first row, first column, what's left is a two by two matrix. Whereas if I focus on the two, I cross out that row and that column, I get four, seven, six, nine, another two by two matrix. And the same for the three. But, you know, it could have been that instead of focusing on the top row, I could have focused on the middle row instead. So if I focus on the middle row, if I concentrate on four and I cross this out, I get the matrix two, three, eight, nine. Whereas if instead I had focused on the 5 and cross out the middle cross, I get 1, 3, 7, 9. Okay, so there it is for a 3 by 3. Of course, it's going to work for a higher degree matrix, a higher dimension matrix. Everything is square as far as we're concerned at the moment. So that's an important sort of construction, the leading row and column. And then the idea being that you should be able to take the determinant of that particular reduced matrix. Well, how do we know we can do that? Certainly we know how to take determinants of 2 by 2 and 3 by 3. So if you start with a 4 by 4 and you do this deletion trick, then you'll at least know how to take the determinant of the 3 by 3 submatrix. And when we put it all together, we'll know how to do 4 by 4. So then you could start with a 5 by 5 and delete, and you get it down to a 4 by 4 and so on. So this is what's called an inductive approach. So if you know how to do a determinant up to level, say, 10 by 10, this will soon show you how to do an 11 by 11. Of course, now that you know that, you can use the same method to do 12 by 12, and so on. So we, this is going to build up like a pyramid that never ends. Okay, so a stack. All right, so what do we do with this? We take the determinant of this. So the determinant of this 
is called the IJF minor. That's the name of it. The IJF minor of A. Again, that's the determinant of the matrix whose ith row and jth column is deleted. So it's a, it's a one-dimensional reduced matrix. It's called the minor. So what's the point of it? The point is that we can now define the determinant of A. What we're going to do, come back up to this picture. We're going to pick our special row, and we're going to look at the first element in that row. And we're going to delete that row and that column. And we'll have this new matrix, and we'll find its determinant. OK? Then we start again. Stay in the same row, but advance one column. This time, when you strike out that column, you'll have a little bit to the left, and then this whole mass to the right. And again, you find that determinant. Then you repeat. You move to the third one. So now you'll have two columns on the left. They're all leading the same row. And so on. And you gather a whole lot of determinants. One for each position. Then all you have to do is alternately add them and subtract them. Add them, subtract them. Add them, subtract them. Whether or not you start with a plus or minus depends on which row you picked. And here is the actual formula. You have to add up all these minors here. And whether it's plus or minus depends on whether i plus j, that's the row plus the column position you're in, is even or odd. I'm sorry, this is j equals 1 to n. So this is a formula. This is expansion along the ith row. OK, so j in this formula is a dummy variable. It gets summed out. When you finish, there's no j. But i is not a dummy variable. The formula depends on i. This is a function of i. But it is a very nice fact that actually it doesn't matter what i is. You get the same number along any row. Same for any row. <laughs> That's a theorem which is proved in the book, which I'm not going to touch. It is the same for any row, first, second, and so on. It doesn't matter. You'll always get the same answer for the determinant. A question. Uh, shouldn't there be a factor of a, i? Oh, hell. The determinant? I forgot to say we're going to multiply it by this. You are quite right. I need to insert it in here. A, i, j. Thank you for that. Right. Otherwise, it would be much easier to compute. It would always be something like 1 or minus 1 or n or something like that. So, indeed. All right, so here is the correct formula. You need to take the subdeterminant and multiply by that entry there. So let's see how this corresponds to what we are saying up here. You take the 1, if we expand along the first row, you take the 1 times this subdeterminant, minus the 2 times this subdeterminant, plus the 3 times this subdeterminant. Now why is it that you have plus, minus, plus? Well, in fact, it's always going to be true, if you sum up these two things, that if you're on the diagonal, for example, that you'll be a plus. And every other one has to be a minus every other in the sense of alternating. So actually, the easiest way to remember what the pluses and minuses are 
to realize that you get a sort of checkerboard pattern. The top corner is always positive. So the top row always looks like this. But the second row, you would start with a minus. The third row, you start with a plus, and so on. These are the coefficients, etc. However big the matrix is. Okay, that's exactly the value of i plus j. When you're at the top left-hand corner, they're both 1. So 1 comma 1. 1 plus 1 is 2. When you're in the second row, but the first column, you're at 2 comma 1. And 2 plus 1 is 3, which is odd. And so that will be a negative. Whereas the same if you're in 1 comma 2. But if you're in 2 comma 2, it's 4. 4 is even, so it's a plus. All right. It's pretty messy, and this is not the only way to compute things, but that's how we're going to define the determinant. All right, so in order to sort of give an example, let's suppose that we have a 4x4 four four matrix, and here's the matrix. So find that determinant. Well, by what I said, you can expand along any row and get the same answer. So the best thing to do would be to expand along the row which is has got the most zeros. So here it is. Expand along this row here. I see two zeros. It's got the most zeros. So expand here. Okay, by the checkerboard pattern, we have plus, minus, so we have plus, minus, plus, minus. So according to the formula, this is equal to 0 times a certain determinant, a1, so it's the third row, first column removed, but who cares about that? Minus 1 times the determinant of a Again, the third row removed, second column, plus 0 times the determinant of A33, minus 2 times the determinant of A34. So now, we actually have to write down what these things are. All right. What do we get? Well, forget about the 0. It's minus 1 times the determinant. OK, we're going to cross out this column. So we've got the determinant of 1, 2, minus 1, 2, minus 1, 1, 1, 3, 4. And then minus 2 times the determinant of, see we can ignore this because of the zero, so now we cross this one out and look at the remaining entries. And we'll have 1, 0, 2, 2, 3, minus 1, 1, 2, 3. Okay, so we've reduced the 4 by 4 into computing a bunch of 3 by 3. In principle, in general, if there's no zeros floating around in any of the rows, you're going to have 4 determinants of 3 by 3 size that you need to work out. Now just imagine how bad the situation is if you have a 5 by 5 matrix. If there's no zeros in that matrix, then in principle you're going to have to pick a row and you will have 5 4 by 4 determinants to compute, each of which has 4 3 by 3 determinants to compute. So that's like 20 3 by 3 determinants each of which you either use Saras' rule or repeat. So this is a pretty nasty computational exercise. In fact, I doubt that a computer can do by this standard method, if you were going to compute by this, it, to do even a, a 20 by 20 would probably take longer than the age of the universe. 
maybe not, I don't know. It's getting pretty large. Depends how fast your computer is. But 30 by 30, I'm pretty sure you can't do it. So luckily we'll see there's another way of doing it a little later. But anyway, so we have this determinants to compute. I might as well just do it. I'm sure I'll get it wrong. But you get minus 1. I'll just, I won't use Saris's rule. I will just do it the other way. So you get 1 times minus 7 plus minus 2 times 8 minus is 7, and then minus 1 times 6 minus minus 1 is 7. And for comic relief, 1 to 9 plus is 11, 0, thank goodness, 2, 4 plus 3 is 7, So here I get minus 28, so I get 28, and then 11 plus 14 is 25. So it's not that bad. I think if I haven't made a mistake, I get minus 22. Question? I mean, you have two times uh, one at the end. Where did I miss the two times one? Minus three. Oh, crap. Thank you. Eleven plus two is thirteen, right? Okay. So it's just two. Yes? We Huh? You got two. Good. Good. Okay. I should have prepared this earlier, but of course I just made up that matrix on the spot, so I have no idea what the determinant is. Anyway, you get the idea. So if you're going to compute a four by four using this expansion, then you see it's in your clear interest to pick the number to pick the, pick the row with the most zeros in it. All right. Any other questions about that? Yes. Um, in the book, it talks about uh, determinants of matrices with n greater than 5. Yes. It said that that determinant had yet to be defined. Do they mean they haven't told us how to figure it out? Okay, so the book says you can't do n greater than 5, but that's until you've done... So you cannot do 5 until you've done 4. Right. Once you've done 4, now you can do 5. Sure. Okay, that's all they meant. Okay, so basically the formula is recursive, it's inductive. It, it relies, in, in order to use this formula here, you need to be able, this is for an n by n matrix, you need to be able to know what the formula is for an n minus 1 by n minus 1 matrix, but it's the same formula with n minus 1 instead of n. So the book is a little confusing, although at that point in the narrative where it mentions 5 by 5, you don't technically know how to do it. So that's all that meant. Pay no attention. You now know how to do n by n. Are there other strategies than picking the row with most zeros? Like, say, like, well, a column had all zeros except for one. Okay, if a column has all zeros except for one, then you don't necessarily have a row. So the next thing I was going to say is you can also do this by columns. Okay, so I'll talk about that. But then there are other strategies for finding the determinant that, have, that don't have anything to do with this method. Okay, so that's what you probably want to do most of the time. But you need to know what the actual definition of it is first. Um, all right, so speaking of columns, it turns out that you could also do the same formula by column instead, or by column. If you work by column, then you would go something like... I challenge anyone to tell me what the actual difference is. Minus 1 to the i plus j, so it's the same checkerboard thing. It's, it, there's no difference there. Don't forget the aij. And it's this minor again, det aij. So this is along the jth column. What is the difference between this formula and the previous formula? Yeah, you're summing over the i's instead of the j's. That's the only difference. And guess what? Not only does it matter not matter which column you pick, it's the same as the other formula. You always get the same answer, unless you make a mistake. If you do it correctly, this is the same, no matter, same for any j, and the same as the computation. 
So for example, if you were to expand along this second column, so eg, to expand this along the second column, you would get 0 times 0 times the determinant. So actually, we're going to do plus, minus, plus, minus, etc. So you, here it'll be minus, plus, minus, plus. So it's actually minus 0 times, although I can't tell the difference between 0 and minus 0, but still, just for to be really good, I'm going to write minus 0 times the determinant of, cross out this row in this column, and you get 2 minus 1, 1, 0, 0, 2, 1, 3, 4, plus 3 times the determinant of. Now cross out this row. I've got a, a lot of rows crossed out now, which is unfortunate. Kind of should erase it every time and restart. So if I work on the 3, I get 1, 2, 1, uh, 0, 0, 2, 1, 3, 4. Minus, what on earth was here? <laughs> was it a minus 1? No. It's a 1? Okay, so minus 1 times the determinant of 1, 2, 1, 2 minus 1, 1. And the bottom row, 1, 3, 4. And then, unfortunately, I also have to finally add 2 times one more determinant, and of course I'm not going to work this out. I get 1, 2, 1, 2, minus 1, 1, 0, 0, 2. So they're all very much the same. 1, 2, 1, 2, minus 1, 1, 0, 0, 2. So these matrices are sort of the same as each other, but they, they have three out of the four available rows, because they're the same columns, you see, that, that I've always deleted the second column of this. So none of these, none of these numbers in this column appear in any of these matrices. But on the other hand, these numbers do appear outside here in alternating fashion. Now, if you work this out, you should get two, unless we both made a mistake last time. Question? Yeah, does that mean that the determinant of a matrix is the same as the determinant of the transpose? Ah, absolutely. The determinant of a matrix is exactly the same as the determinant of the transpose, because you can expand <laughs> along rows or columns. Yes, but that is a fact that I was going to give in the next section which I'm just about to get up to. Um, but very, yeah, good observation. I don't, even, I don't know even if the book puts it that clearly, by the way. The book sort of says, oh yeah, they're the same, but it, it, I don't think it mentions that it's the same because you can actually expand along rows or columns. But, that, but one of them is very easy. If the matrix is triangular, say the matrix A is upper triangular, So it looks like this, A11, A12, up to A1N, A22 is what a ballerina, okay, anyways, A33, A3N, and so on, down to ANN, but all this is zero, zero. What's the determinant of such an object? Well, let's suppose we expand it along the first column. So according to the formula, it's A11 times the determinant of this. Because everything else is 0. So this is A11 times the determinant of just this upper triangular matrix. But what's that determinant? Well, by repeating the process, it's A22 times the determinant here, because all the other determinants that you'd have to compute are 0. So this is, oops, this is A11, A22 times the determinant of A33 down to ANN with A34 and so on. 
etc. 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 down to A11, A22, all the way up to An minus 1, N minus 1, times the determinant of the 1 by 1 matrix, which is ANN. Of course, that is just the product of the diagonals. Now, in order to prove that without saying, oh, and so on, you have to use induction, which is sort of technically you've seen many times, but maybe never formally. And there's a proof in the book. But what I'm going to do is show you a harder example. But for the moment, you should learn the fact that the determinant of an upper triangular matrix is the product of its diagonals. Now, by your observation about transposes, it's the same thing for lower triangular, because after all, a lower triangular matrix is the transpose of an upper triangular matrix. If you transpose that matrix, it becomes lower triangular. Well, there, if you want to prove it directly, you would expand in rows instead, and you would get the same result. So in general, the determinant of a triangular matrix equals product of the diagonal elements, which is a nice result. And this is triangular upper or lower. Doesn't matter. Same, same result. OK, so if you have to take the determinant of a triangular matrix, for goodness sake, don't use don't use any check. Yep, don't use any of this other formulas, just multiply the diagonal elements. OK, so that's one observation. Now, speaking of induction, here's a nice problem that I took from the problem. Well, it's not from your homework, but it's, it's from the back of the book. This is an example of induction. Example. So it's, 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 let A n be the following matrix. Okay, it's a bit of a weird matrix, so bear with me. I will tell you what's on the diagonal. It's all fives. And so on. Except the very last ent entrant is a two. So the diagonal. An is n by n. The diagonal, all fives, except that An n equals two. Okay, so that tells you all about the diagonal. The diagonal above the main diagonal has all sixes on it. So. Diagonal above the main one, diag above main, all six. Whereas the diagonal below the main is going to be all ones. Diag below the main, all ones. And everything else is zero. Zero. OK. I admit this is a pretty bizarre matrix. It's hard to see how it would come up in practice, but you sort of would be surprised. You would be surprised. I mean, maybe not this exact matrix, but often you get these matrices with whose entries are clustered around the diagonal in actual applications. Because when you multiply this, it's sort of saying 5 times the first entry plus 6 times the second entry is something. And then 5 times the second plus the six minus, well, plus the first, and, and so on. So this actually samples the same sort of ratio, one of one entrant, 5 of the next, plus 6 of the third one all the way down, except at the end. So things like Fibonacci sequences come out like this. You add 1 plus 1 to get 2, and 1 plus 2 to get 3, and so on. So actually, 
these same energies just come up and come more than you think in practice. So the question is maybe not as bizarre as you think. Well, what is the question? The question is to find the determinant of this for any n. Yes, my sentiments exactly. All right. So find the determinant of a n. Okay, so what you don't want to do is just bust out the formula directly. You need to be a little clever. So let's see. So here's the real crucial thing. The real crucial thing is that if you take a n, which I'll write like this, 5, 6, 1, what's this? What's that? How would you describe everything else in a n? Yeah, see, this is like a mini coffee. If you don't believe me, just imagine filling in a n minus 1. You would get 5, 6, 1, 5, and so on, which is exactly what you need to flesh out a n. Unfortunately, this will not be enough, because when we do our expansion, this will sort of cover the first rows, say, if we expand by rows, but it will not cover the second row. So we're going to need to be more sophisticated yet and have another formula for an, which looks like this. Okay, now I've written out the first two rows of an and the first two columns. So I've left myself with an n minus 2 by n minus 2 matrix. What is that matrix? An An minus 2. Okay, so I want to stress that I knew in advance that I would have to do this. It's not obvious at all. I knew that I have to do it because I've seen this sort of problem before. But you will soon see why you need to do this. Now, this works because you have two rows or two elements here which are non-zero. If you had three and you could be writing down, down, then you'd need to go one more level. Anyway, let's see where we're at. Let's see where we're at and why those two facts are going to be so useful. Okay, so we want to take the determinant of this mess. Let's start with my second picture here. Okay, so the determinant of a n, well, let's actually start with the first one. We're going to expand along the first column. Expand along first column. We could choose this first row as well. But what the hey, I'll choose the first column. So what have we got to do? We've got to have 5 times the determinant of what's left, which we've already observed is a n minus 1. So this is going to be 5 times the determinant of a n minus 1. OK, but you see, this picture is useless when I move down to the next element, because I will squish out that row. I will squish out that row, and that's no good. That's where the second picture is going to come in very handy. I'm going to concentrate now on the 1. So I'm going to have minus 1 times something. And in order to see what that is, let's cross out this row and let's cross out this column and copy what's left as follows. Looks like this. 6, 1. It has an an minus 2 here. And everything else is zeros. So there's the first... There's the first thing you have to do. Okay? Does everyone is everyone happy with what I've done so far? I'm expanding down this column here. Five just gives me 
the whole of an minus one to work with. Whereas as this picture shows, when you delete this one, or when you work on the one and you delete that row and that column, you have an minus two with the extra one hanging around and the extra six and everything else zero. All right, now we have to work on this determinant here. I'm going to expand this determinant, say, along the top row. So it's six times the determinant. So let's just leave this for the moment. Five debt an minus one minus one times six times the determinant of an minus two. And there's nothing else because all of the other values in this top row are zero. So you just get six times that determinant. And that's it. We have a formula sort of. So we have a formula. Now it's not explicit, but it's kind of nice because if you know what the previous two values of the determinant are, then you're golden. So let's let debt an be equal to, let, let's let f of n be this. Let f of n equal the determinant. I should have written that on one line. Let f of n equal the determinant. So this equation says that f of n equals 5f of n minus 1 minus 6f of n minus 2. But it does not tell me what f of 1 is. So let's just try to compute f, f of 1. That's the determinant of, of a1, a1, which is a 1 by 1 matrix. What is the element in a1? It's 2. It's two. Where are all the 5s and 6s? Well, there's only a main diagonal. There's no off diagonals because the matrix is too small. It's just 1 by 1. So is it a 2 or a 5? Well, I told you the last one is 2. How about f of 2? Well, I'm just going to have to draw the matrix. It's going to be a 2, a 5, a 6, and a 1. 5 times 2 minus 6 times 1 is 4. So I actually had to compute f of 1 and f of 2 by hand. How did we choose f of 1 to be all the way in the bottom? Well, f of 1 is the 1 by 1 matrix that, that fits this pattern. Okay? And it's sort of hard to tell whether it's 2 or 5, but I'm just asserting there's always a 2. And then as we build it up, there's going to be fives. The rest of them are fives. So the first one is two. That's a little bit of a subtle point. You have to define it very well. But if you look at this, a n, n by n, the diagonals are all fives, except a n n, which is two. So when n equals one, you know a one one equals two. And all the others are fives. OK, there's nothing else. But they're all five anyway, see? OK, there aren't any. OK, so anyway, the second one is 4, and you have to do that by hand. But you don't have to do any of the others. How do you find f of 3? You use this formula. It's 5f of 2 minus 6f of 1. And if you plug in these two values, you get 5 times 4 minus 6 times 2, which is 20 minus 12, which is 8. If you don't believe me, check that. This is true. The determinant of 5, 5, 2, 6, 6, 1, 1. Just actually compute that, and you'll find that you get 8. How about f of 4? Let's just do that. f of 4 is 5f of 3 minus 6f of 2. I'm just applying this formula here. It's always 5 of the previous one minus 6 of the one 2. So if you get 5 times 8 minus 6 times 4. That's 40 minus um, 24 is 16. And we can compute f of 5 if we want. Does anyone see a pattern? 2, 4, 8, 16? 30. Yeah, f of 5 should maybe be 32, right? So we're going to take a plunge and guess that f of n is actually 2 to the n. That's an explicit formula. But we need to prove that. So here's where the induction is going to come in. In principle, the induction is already here, in the sense that we've 
got a formula for a n inductively, or the determinant inductively in terms of the previous ones. But the act, we haven't really proved anything so much by induction, because we've used the fact effectively that a n is defined inductively itself. To define a n, we kind of use a n minus 1 and a n minus 2. Anyway, never mind about that. How are we going to prove? that f of n is equal to 2 to the n. We don't need anything about determinants. All we need are the following three facts. Just using the following three facts. f of n is equal to 5 f of n minus 1 minus 6 f of n minus 2. So that's the formula that we've found. And we need f of 1 equals 2 and f of 2 equals 4. You have to compute those first two to get the ball rolling along. This formula requires the two previous ones. So you cannot get it started otherwise. OK, so here's how the proof works. You're going to write the following. Proof by induction. OK, so first, note that it's true for n equals 1 and n equals 2. That's just from these two facts. Right, this is equal to 2 to the 1, and this is equal to 2 to the 2. So it's true for n equals 1 and n equals three, uh, 2. Now, assume true for n minus 1 and n minus 2. Assume it's true. So i.e., assume... And we have to go back to what we want to prove, which is this. We're assuming that equation is true for the particular values n minus 1 and n minus 2. So we're assuming that f of n minus 1 is equal to 2 to the n minus 1. And f of n minus 2 equals 2 to the n minus 2. Now we'll show it's true for n. How do we do that? Here's the, here's the equation. f of n is equal to 5 f of n minus 1 minus 6 f of n minus 2. Now, these are already previous cases, and we're assuming that our formula is true. So this is 5 times 2 to the n minus 1 minus 6 times 2 to the n minus 2. Okay, that's the crucial idea. If the formula works up to a certain point, then you already know that you can just replace f of n minus 1 by 2 to the n minus 1. And you already know the same thing for n minus 2. And now what you hope to get is that it now works for the next one. So if it works for 1 and 2, then this is going to show it works for 3. But then you know it works for 2 and 3, so then it will work for 4. But then we already know it's true for 3 and 4, so it works for 5. And the whole thing bootstraps itself off to infinity. But we need this to be equal to 2 to the n. So what are we going to do? We are going to factor out 2 to the n minus 2. So this is 5 times 2 times 2 to the n minus 2. After all, 2 to the n minus 1 is two or twice 2 to the n minus 2. So I make this. 10 minus 6. Lots of 2 to the n minus 2. But 10 6 is a 4. And 4, that's a times here. And 4 is 2 squared. And lo and behold, it's 2 to the n. And that's the whole proof. Therefore, true by induction. Pretty subtle. Okay. Everyone understand what we've done? I mean, the mechanics are one thing, but just the philosophy of what it's what it's doing is that is it striking a chord, or is this just all gobbledygook?
show me some, show me some reactions here. Okay, I get a thumbs up, nods of understanding. Okay, I don't hear too many growls of discontent. So I guess you've probably seen some induction before anyway. So. But this is a little bit, often the way induction is, you know it's true for n minus one, you have to true, show it's true for n. This one had one extra little layer in that you needed it to be true for both n minus one and n minus two to get the next one for n. So actually what that means is you need two starting cases, as I said. You can't hope to get three unless you have both one and two. A question. Are the fives and sixes just arbitrary choices of numbers to fill in the columns, or is there a reason why those are one? So the question is, why fives and sixes and ones and a two for that matter? Sure, I mean, the book carefully selected those numbers so that the formula came out kind of magically as two to the n, right? And the crucial relationship was that, you know, five times two minus six happens to be four. Okay, now the fact is that the ones are also crucial there. If you change those to another number, then yeah, it doesn't work either. So, I, but there, if there are three numbers or even an extra one that's different, you're always going to get some nice formula like this. It just may be like a sum of exponentials or difference. So it won't, may not be as pretty, but you, know, you can always do something like this. So then, of course, it becomes harder to guess the formula. Here, I look, it's 2, 4, 8, 16. Okay, or I could have done 32, and then we really would have, you know, guessed it. And otherwise, it's harder to write down an exact formula. But there's a general method of solving these recurrence relations. This is called a recurrence relation because you recurring, uh, well, you're looking at the previous values. So there's a general method for solving this, which is not in this course. All right, another question. Is this indicative of the difficulty of problems? Uh, do I think this problem might be on the quiz? I actually haven't seen inductive problems on previous quizzes, but I have a feeling that they might do one this time. I don't, I have no evidence. I have no evidence and I have no idea which one. I haven't seen the quiz. It hasn't even been made up yet to my knowledge. But uh, I don't know. I just saw in the official syllabus this time that inductive things should be taught and I hadn't seen it previously. So it's possible. It's possible. Or maybe not on the quiz, maybe on the final. Or maybe not. I can't tell you. I, honestly, it, I haven't seen it. If it exists, I haven't seen it. I don't think it exists yet. So, of course, I'm going to go home and make up a really nice question and tell them to use it. No. I don't have any power over this sort of stuff, so please. Okay. Anyway, that's all I have to say about 6.1. So I'd like to move on to 6.2. So I think I'm firmly in going ahead territory here. I has anyone started 6.2 in class yet? Well, I have half an hour. I might as well just do it, right? Then next week I can sort of do 6.3 and 7.1 and 7.2. And then actually I'm going to miss the week after, uh, which is the night before your quiz. And I have a substitute who's going to do all the Q&A with you. So. <laughs> It's Spiros, he's really good, I have no troubles. I just can't do it. I cannot do it, I will in fact be in Australia, so it is impossible. It's impossible for me to teach it from there. Okay, here is a much, much better way to compute determinants. The answer is to do a Gauss-Jordan elimination plus a good output. So better way, Gauss-Jordan elimination Plus bookkeeping. Okay, in order to motivate this, let's think of the three different things we do in Gauss Jordan elimination. There's three operations. One, you can multiply or divide a row. So actually, I'll write divide row k. Right? Remember, if you're working on a row and you've decided that's the pivot element, and it's not a 1, you would divide the row by whatever value it is. So if it's a 3, you divide by a 3. Now, if you're going to do that, you will, of course, change the matrix from one step to another, to the next step. So my question is, what does that do to the determinant? It's not the same. The determinant will change. So let's say I have a matrix like this, 2, 3, 5, 1, 0, 4, 0, 2, 2, and I want to find its determinant. Well, if I were doing Gauss-Jordan elimination, the first thing I would do 
is reduce this to one three halves, five halves, one zero four zero two two, right? I pick this thing and divide by two. So what have I done to the determinant? Without actually computing either determinant, tell me how does this determinant relate to that determinant? It's a half. It's half as much. Determinant divides by k as well. Why is it a half as much? Well, if you think about expanding in this case along the first row, you have 2 times this determinant plus 3 times this subdeterminant, I'm sorry, minus 3 times this plus 5 times this. Well, if you now do this one, it's 1 times this minus 3 halves times this plus 5 halves times this. So expanding along the row, all of those aijs are halved, but none of the other stuff is affected. Now, of course, if you're not working with the first row, but you're in the second row, well, you just expand the determinant along the second row. And you see that every element in the second row, say, would be half as much. And then the determinant would be half as much. So if you divide any row by k, then the determinant divides by k. So right now, I'm telling you, if you're along the process of eliminating this and you say, OK, I divided this by 2, normally you would just do it and you wouldn't keep a record of it. Now I'm saying do some bookkeeping. And remember, I divided this row by 2, so the determinant has to divide by 2. OK, so that's the first possible operation. Another possible operation is that you could swap two rows. So when might you have to do that? Well, if instead you had this. Suppose that you were trying to row reduce this. Suppose you were trying to row reduce this. Well, can't you use this of it? Because it's zero. You can't divide by zero. Everything would be fine if these were also zeros, but they're not. So what you might want to do is switch these two around. And so the first step you would do is this: one, five, four, zero, two, three, two, six, seven. Okay. So we've switched the two rows. What does that do to the determinant? Not quite nothing, almost nothing. It makes it negative. Because all we've done is just change up the checkerboard. See, the numbers just get changed in position. So if you expand along this row, it's the same as expanding along this row. But because the row is in a different place, here, if you expand along this row, you have plus, minus, plus. Whereas here, you get minus, plus, minus. So if you switch two of the rows around, the determinant changes sign. Well, that's a, that was going to be my next point. When I say swap two rows, I mean two adjacent rows, really. So swap two adjacent rows is the best way to be safe. You see, sometimes you might think, oh, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just throw this down in the bottom. Well, if you do that, you've really done two swaps. So if you shove this row down the bottom, you have to think of that as first switch those two, and then second switch those two. So if you put the first row down the bottom, the determinant doesn't change. You have two swaps, which change signs so it cancels each other out, and you get the same. I was talking about, okay, suppose you do a swap, forget this stage, you do a swap that directly puts the first row down the bottom, like this. And now the middle stage in the middle or it goes up? Yeah, I was going to leave it like this. I was just going to move this. So we wouldn't have thought twice before about moving this down. That's a totally legitimate. We just changed the order of the, uh, of the uh, equations, as it were. Okay, but what I'm saying is that's actually two swaps from the original. Because if you push this in the middle, you get one, five, four, 
well, you get this. And now if you swap these two rows, you get this. If you reverse the entire order, then it will be a third swap, absolutely. If you put the two, six, seven on the top. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. It, it, it just move, move, move problems, problems around. You have to just count the actual number of swaps. If you move rows around, rather. Okay, so it, just think of swapping two adjacent rows as changing the sign. And you can get to any particular configuration by switching adjacent rows if you do enough switches. So you need to keep track of that. Okay, the third thing that you can do is, and this is the real crucial step, when you get down to here, what do you do? You subtract the first row from this. Or if this was, say, a 4 here, you'd subtract 4 times the first row from the second row. So subtract multiple of one row from another. That's the, that's the third operation and by far the most useful. What does that do to the determinant? Well, this is not obvious at all. But thank heavens, it doesn't change the determinant. Yay, that's worth a yay. That's worth a yay because I mean, that, that, would be a, that would be really nasty. So basically, all you have to do is count, take count of the number of divisions that you've done, you know, or actually the actual values of the divisions, and then um, the number of swaps, whether it's odd or even. And then you can completely compute the determinant. Why? Because if you keep reducing everything down, you will get the identity, 1, 1, 1, which has determinant 1. It's worth noting that the determinant of the identity is 1. You can see that pretty easily. Now, what if you don't have all zeros uh, or 1s? You might have, it's a square matrix, so you, when you row reduce it, you either get all 1s or you get a 0. Well, if there's any 0 on the diagonal, when you've reduced it, the determinant is 0. And then you don't have to keep track of anything. <laughs> Doesn't matter how many swaps or sign changes, 0 is still 0. The matrix would not be invertible then, because its reduced form is one, uh, is, has zeros rather on the diagonal, and therefore the determinant is zero, and vice versa. So that's actually, that's actually a proof, if you believe it. Maybe, maybe there's a particularity in here, but essentially that's a proof that the determinant will be zero if and only if the matrix is not invertible. Okay, let me say that again. If the matrix is invertible, you do all these operations. Blah, 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 blah. These three, you do one, two, three, two, two, three, one, please. And you get down eventually to the identity. Because if, if the matrix is invertible, its reduced form is one. One, 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 the identity. This determinant is one. So all you've done is a bunch of divisions and a bunch of sign changes, and so you will ch change 1 into some other number, but it won't be 0, because you can never divide by 0. So the determinant will be non-zero. If, on the other hand, the matrix that you started with is not invertible, its reduced form has a bunch of zeros in the diagonal, so the determinant will be 0. And then all of these other changes, changing sign, dividing by some other numbers, you will get 0 still. Okay, So actually, that's a proof if you believe these facts, that the determinant determines whether it's invertible or not, by whether it's non-zero or zero. So what was true for 3 by 3 and 2 by 2 matrices is also true for higher dimensional matrices. So that's very important, of course. We didn't say it in general, but this shows, once you've put together this proof of I've that debt A equals zero, or is not zero, if and only if A is invertible. Everything is square. In chapter six, everything is square. If it's rectangular, 
not square, it doesn't have a determinant, can't be invertible, none of this stuff makes sense. Okay, question. This is probably a silly question, but why is the determinant of a single number just that single number? Why is the determinant of a one by one matrix the single number? What is is the question. Good? That 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 single number. Well, uh, if you think of it as a volume, here's the one dimensional number line. I want to know what is the volume, which in one dimension is length, of that parallelogram. Well, it's not a parallelogram, it's just Okay, it's just it's just the, the length. But why, why should we think of it as a length? Well, because it is for one dimension, two dimensions, three dimensions, as we've seen, and also it will be for, for n dimensions once we do section 6.3 next time. A determinant is literally the volume of an n-dimensional parallelly pipered that whose vectors are the, spanned spanned by the columns of the matrix. That's exactly what it is. Okay, it, it, it's signed though in the sense that if you go this way, it's it's the negative of the volume. It's a signed volume, just like in integration, we had signed areas. So. Okay, and that's why I said it's really the only thing it could be. When I say the determinant formula, is it's really the only function that has this property. Some multiple of it might have this property as well, but it wouldn't be the volume. It'd be a multiple of the volume. All right. And by the way, that way it's the volume volume is an immense hint of why determinants come up in multivariable calculus. The Jacobian is the determinant of this derivative matrix. So that's the expansion matrix, and it's completely related to this volume stuff. So it's, this, 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 it's a nice connection, but we're not quite ready to make it all yet. All right, anyway. So I want to give an example of how to use this Gauss-Jordan elimination to find a determinant. But before I do, I want to point out one thing. When you do the elimination, you get all the way down to, say, 111, or 11111, the identity. But you don't have to go all the way down. You do not have to go all the way down for this purpose. In fact, it's only necessary to get down to a triangular matrix. Because if you get down to a triangular matrix, then you can easily compute the determinant. So, I'll basically say you can do the complete elimination, but you only need to to eliminate down to triangular, upper triangular in this case. So, as an example, I would be very grateful if someone would kindly Repeat to me the 4x4 four four matrix that I had from before that we thought the determinant was 2. Okay, it's um, 1, 0. Are you working across? Yes. Okay. 1, 0, 2, negative 1. Thank you. 2, 3, negative 1, 1. 0, 1, 0, 2. 1, 2, 3, 4. Excellent. Thank you. All right. So let's just do a row reduction. The first one, we don't have to do anything to this first row. There's our pivot. We don't have to divide because there's already a 1. So the first thing we're going to do is leave this row. And then I'm going to subtract twice this row from the second row. And I get 0, 3, minus. 5, 3. Here I'm going to do nothing. And here I'm just going to subtract once this row. And I'll get 0, 2, 1, 5. Everyone agree so far? What have I done to the determinant? How does the determinant of this compare to the determinant if you believe what I said before? It's the same. Determinant unchanged. Let's call this matrix A. OK, so the next thing I need to do is take that element and make that and divide that by 3. I could do that. Ah, maybe a better thing, since I already have a 1 here, is to switch it. So you could choose either path. I choose the path of least resistance because I don't want to deal with minus 5 thirds. So I'm going to switch these two rows around. So that 
reduces to 1, 0, 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, minus 5, 3, 0, 2, 1, 5. What have I done to the sign of the determinant? Okay, so I'm going to put a minus 1 up here. That's a factor that I have to deal with. Okay, because I've switched the rows. Okay, flash it. Now I'm going to take away three lots of this row from here and two lots of this row from there, and neither of them is going to change the determinant. So I get 0, 1, 0, 2. Now take away three lots of this. I get 0, 0, minus 5, 3 minus 6 is negative 3. And then from here, I'm going to take 2 away. So I'm going to get 0, 0, 1, 1. Okay. Now, next. Yeah, next I could switch them around again. But this time I'm going to play pat by my previous. I'm going to divide this column by this row by minus 5. So divide by minus 5. So I don't know the best way that you want to say what the divisions are. I'm just going to put a minus 5 here because that's what I've divided by. Okay, maybe I'll just put a divide above, and we'll soon see how to handle this. I'm going to have to write here, just so I fit this whole thing in. I, I think the best way would be to switch again, but I just for illustrative purposes, I'm going to divide it. 0, 0, 1, 3 fifths, and then I have 0, 0, 1, 1. This is a division here. Divide by minus 5. Okay, so now I'm going to subtract this row from this row. That doesn't change the determinant again. So I get 1, 0, 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 0, 1, 3 fifths, and then 0, 0, 1, and I'm 1 minus 3 fifths is 2 fifths. I'm sorry, 0, 0. OK, now, if I were doing the complete reduction, I would also subtract this row, twice that row, in fact, from this row to get rid of that 2 there. But you don't need to do this from the point of view of the determinant, because now we have an upper triangular matrix. Upper triangular. So you don't need to go and. You can if you want, but it's not going to change the determinant. OK, so now we stop. This has debt equal to 2 fifths. It's just the product, 1 times 1 times 1 times 2 fifths. So what does this show? OK, this shows, looks like I'm out by a minus. No, you're fine. I'm fine? Oh, yeah, there is a minus 5. Thank you. So let's put it all together. This shows that debt A times all the factors. What have we got? We've got a nothing here. We've got a minus 1 there. And then we have a minus 1 fifth, because we divided by 5, is equal to 2 fifths. Now, so whether or not you want to write here, this is a sort of question of style. If I said, oh, I'm dividing by 5, so I've got a minus a, a fifth there, then you take debt A and you multiply by minus 1 times minus a fifth to get down to 2 fifths. So this actually says debt A is 2. But if you prefer, you could keep track of the reciprocals so that you'd have a minus 5, and then you multiply the final answer that you have by those numbers. So if you prefer, you can say, OK, I'll keep the minus 5 and the minus 1, and I'll multiply the 2 fifths by minus 5 to get 2. The trick is not to divide this by 5 and get 2 20 fifths. OK, so when I say the debt divides by k, what I mean is the new determinant is 
one case of the old. So as long as you remember that you've taken the old and divided by a k to get the new one, you'll be able to get it right. So I don't know what the best way of doing this is. Maybe just keep the reciprocals here as the factors and then multiply the original one to get the to get the one and then solve the original. For the original. It's one extra step, but maybe it's safer than keeping the, the divisors and multiplying the right by them in the first place. Is that making sense? I mean, it's just a question of whether you want to write down debt A equals the final determinant times all of these things that you have, or whether you want to write debt A times these factors equals the final determinant and then solve for debt A. So I don't really know what the, question, what the correct thing is. Just see what your teacher teaches you and then see what you like the best. Okay, but anyway, so that's a verification that the, uh, the determinant there is 2. All right. So, um, let's see, I still have five minutes. Might as well go on a little bit, huh? Why not? Are there any questions about that before I move on? Can't even find my notes anymore. Here they are. Well, I have time to tell you a couple of astonishing facts. But here is the most astonishing. So really nice fact. Only one of them is astonishing. Here goes. The determinant of AB, the product of two n by n matrices. is the product of the determinants. Whoa. Indeed. OK. That's very, very nice. OK, so why is it true? I just want to, I don't have a lot of time left, and I kind of need to come back to this next time. But I might as well give you a few minute spiel on why it's true it doesn't take very long. OK, so first, let's say A is invertible. If A is invertible, here's what you set up a augmented matrix looks like this. Like this. So in one, in one, on the left, you put the n by n matrix AB. And on the right, you put A. Now, suppose that you do, well, maybe I'll do A on the left. Let's do that. Do A on the left and AB. It's more natural that way. OK, so this is a 2n by n matrix. And you've seen this sort of thing before when you try to find the inverse. So let's actually do the steps needed to find the inverse of A. You do all the steps. Blah, blah, blah. Divide this, divide that, blah, blah, you know, shift, swatch. And you do the same things exactly to AB. So when you reduce this, it will reduce to IN because A is assumed, assumed to be invertible. But you will find that this reduces to B. OK, so I'm sort of claiming that. And it's not hard to see. I mean, we've seen this sort of thing before. Right. If, in fact, you had the identity here, this would reduce to A inverse. And so by the linearity of this whole process, if the identity goes to A inverse, then AB will go to B. So that's worthy of checking. I'm not going to prove it, but at least it's sort of plausible. Now, all the steps. This says debt A. Suppose debt A is equal to all the divisions we'll keep as multiplications and all the sign swaps, sign swaps. So we'll have however many there are of those times the determinant of IN. But on the other hand, AB has exactly the same swaps and gets reduced to B. So the determinant of AB has the same factors. Exactly the same numbers, where these are minus ones or whatever you divided by. 
times the determinant of b. But if you put these two things together, I can put the fact that the determinant of i n is just 1, you see the product of all these switches is just the determinant of a. This is debt a. And there it is. The determinant of a, b is just the determinant of a times the determinant of b. Now that's in the case where a is invertible. If a is not invertible, we know debt a equals 0. So how about debt a, b? Well, what's the image of A? Image of A is not all of Rn. Because if it were, then the rank of A would be N, which would mean it would be invertible. So the rank of A is less than N, not equal to. But then the image of AB, we've seen this many, many times is a subset of the image of A. After all, what could, where could A be? A be it's the name A of B of X. A times B of X is definitely in the image of A. And that's in the image of AB. So this is also not all of Rn. In other words, rank AB, this is true for any square matrices, rank AB is always less than rank A. Actually, it's true for any product at all. The rank of AB is less than or equal to the rank of A. And in this case, it's less than M. So AB is not invertible. And so the debt of AB is zero as well. And that proves this formula, because if A is not invertible, then the right-hand side is 0, so the left-hand side is 0 too. So if A is not invertible, you don't need any of this reduction. You just argue directly. If it is, then you have to be more careful. Where is this rank A less than N? Is that not equal N? Yeah. In this case. If it did, did equal N. Okay. So I mean, less than N, then so it's less than N. rank A is less than N and not equal to n. I mean, less than is the same as less than and not equal. The only reason you put the not equal is to really emphasize it. So that's, that's the proof. I don't, you don't need to know that proof, but you need to know the formula. So next time we'll see what the implications of that formula are and how to deal with volumes, and then, of course, eigenvalues and stuff like that as well. All right.